realized that the Lord was kind of putting together a little series on play on words, importance of things that he's been showing me that is so important for our salvation and for, uh, you know, the importance of the abiding is, is, is key, abiding in him for everything. When we abide, when we found out that being abiding is being in His presence, to stay in His presence, to dwell with Him, and then at, because of that, that we'll be able to stand. It's it's all in the Greek, you know. The uh, the Greek definition has everything we need to do, and we know that there is a people at the end that will be able to stand at the second coming of Christ. And there are certain things that we must possess in order to stand. And how we get there is through the abiding. Before I start this, so today is going to be on meekness. And when you, when you hear the words of Matthew 5, 5, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. It's a promise that whoever is going to inherit the eat, they're going to have this characteristic. So I'm going to bow one more time and say a prayer before we get started. Heavenly Father, these words are not my words. I did not put this slide together. You did. By me abiding in you morning by morning, you continued to get, give things and add things to it. And even in my morning devotional, Lord, it was all on meekness. You have written this because your word was inspired fully and 100% by you, and we believe that. And we know that humility has part to do with meekness, but it is not the whole thing, Lord. Meekness is a total surrender, a total surrender to your will and to know that through these life here, that whatever we go through, whatever trial we have, it is meant to happen to change us, to change us to be more like you, to cut off those rough edges that we have and to know that we could depend 100% on your word as truth. And as I speak today, Lord, guide my lips. You've taught me how to read. You've taught me how to speak in front of people. Lord, you know what my biggest fear in the world was, was to speak in front of people. And it shows your glory just to me being up here. So be with me now and be with this congregation and let the, let the words cut through them as they did me through this week. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So as I started going through the, the, um, the Bible and seeking out meekness, I wanted to know if meek are going to inherit the earth, what does it truly mean to be meek? And where are my examples at? So uh, first, I just want to read. I just want to read through some of the verses that you find on meekness. In Psalms 37.10, For yet a little while, and the wicked shall not be. Yeah, thou shalt diligently consider his place, and it shall not be. But the meek shall inherit the earth, and shall delight themselves in the abundance of peace. I think we see here another place where Jesus gets his, his stuff. We know that he is the, the inspiration of the whole Old Testament. But so many places in the Psalms, you can see the Beatitudes. And we can see right here where Jesus is repeating from the Old Testament. In Zephaniah 2.3, Seek ye the Lord, all ye meek of the earth which have wrought his judgment. Seek righteousness and seek meekness. The righteousness and meekness come together. It may be ye yourselves be hid in the day of the Lord's anger. See, both of these things are 
talking in second coming that if we have that meekness that we are going to be protected in Isaiah 61 1 I've read this so many times but I never really it never hit me the first part of it the spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings to the meek Very first thing, he has good news for the meek. Because why? Because the meek are going to be the ones inheriting the earth. The meek are the ones that are going to be spreading the gospel. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and to open up the opening of the prisons to them that are bound. And I went this far because this, I want you to pay special attention to this, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all that mourn. Is that the first beatitude? Blessed are they that mourn because they will be comforted. Psalms 25, 9, the meek will he guide in judgment and the meek well, he teach his ways. First Peter three three, whose adorning let it be not be the outward adorning of plating the hair and wearing of gold and putting on of apparel, but let it be the hidden man of the heart, in that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is the sight of God a great price. Psalms 149.4, For the Lord taketh pleasure in his people. He will beautify the meek with salvation. I can't wait for that day of translation, guys. So I just wanted to put these out here before we go into the definition. Because it seems to me that meekness is a very key part of salvation. And what we must obtain in us, our character we know that Christ is meek and lowly at heart. So, the Greek word is uh, praos. Praos, gentle, humble. And everybody, we all consider, you know, meekness. We all think about humility when it comes to meekness. And it is true that it, humility is a big part of meekness. But a lot of people take that as a weakness or that you're a floor mat. But that's absolutely not the whole part, uh, everything that uh, meekness means. Meekness towards God is the disposition of spirit in which we accept his dealings with us as good. And therefore, without disputing or resisting, the meek man truly acknowledges himself as a sinner among sinners. And this knowledge of his own sin teaches him to meekly endure the provocations of others and not to withdraw from the burdens of their sins may oppose on them. Have we ever stepped away from somebody or people because are not wanting to go to certain situations because of the characters of other people, because of the sins that they possess? I have. I thought I need to stay away from these things. Maybe, I mean, I've, you've seen it a lot of times. I mean, Adventist bubbles where we seclude ourselves from the world in certain ways. And, and, and when you're a baby Christian, I think that's a good thing. But when we start abiding and we start becoming as like, like Christ and we start filling ourselves with the Holy Spirit and letting His light shine through us, that's what we're called to do. We're called to be lights in those darkness, to be different. I'm working in a jail right now that's full of darkness, but God has showed me, he's teaching me this meekness as I'm going through this, and he's showing how much that could change people's mindsets. So, we're going to go to Galatians, and we're going to go to Timothy, and we're going to go to Titus after this. The meek are those who wholly rely on God rather than their own strength to defend them against injustice. 
Thus, meekness towards evil people means knowing God is permitting the injuries they inflict, that he is using them to purify his elect, and that he will deliver his elect in his time. It's a tough pill to swallow sometimes to know that we are going through these things, that some of these things, there are some things that are hard that we have been through in our life. I've been through some rough stuff. I grew up in a whole different world than I live in now. But you know what? I praise God that I lived through them. I praise God that I went through them because I would not be able to witness to somebody going through that situation right now. I would not be able to witness to somebody that has not overcame yet and show them that they have victory in Christ and through his word that he gives you the power to overcome. When I quit smoking, he made it easy. I went through him. I tried. I quit. I smoked cigarettes for 26 years. I tried to quit. I don't even know how many times. But when God came into my life and I stood on his promise and I took a, my last cigarette and I threw it out on the ground and I said, I can't overcome it, Lord, but you can. And I never, I can't say never, I rarely ever had an urge for a cigarette again. And I've quit smoking for over four years now. The meek will stand on the promises of God. We will know them to be true. In Galatians 6, 1, it says, Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness. In the way we behave in front of these people, in front of our brothers and sisters, they are all, we are one family out there, and God has so many out there that have not yet come to our faith or come to him. But by what we do, by standing on truth, by being truth, by, by, say, by being a person of our word, if we say that we're going to do something for somebody, we better do it. If we say that we're going to help somebody, help them. It's about stepping outside of self, guys. Consider thyself, lest thou also be tempted. Bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. Look at the Second Timothy 2.5. It says, In meekness instruct those that oppose themselves in God's pre uh, preadventure. Will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth, and that they may recover themselves out of the snares of the devil who are taking them captive by his will. That's an amazing gift that we might, can have the ability to do by showing, by when somebody is cursing you out, by when somebody is, is behaving, just living a life that they think that they can't get out of, just you being there and showing them victory, just by, by showing them love even though they're showing you hate. We're going to get more into it. In Titus 3.2, To speak evil of no man, to be of no brawler, but gentle, showing all meekness unto all men. For we ourselves also were sometimes foolish, disobedient, deceiving, serving diverse lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful, and hating one another. We've got to remember these things, the victories that he's given as we look at somebody else and know that we were once sitting in those shoes. I was once wearing baggy pants thinking I was some kind of gangster because of the product of the area I grew up in. But it was through people with a big heart people that showed love when I didn't deserve it, that changed me. It was God's character in other people. And through his word, and seeing, looking Christ full in his face, and seeing what true love is. 
not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but by according to his mercy, he saves us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. It's him. Now, this is continuing on to, from the definition. Gentleness and meekness is the opposite of self-assertiveness and self-interest. It stems from trust in God's goodness and control over the situation. The gentle person is not occupied with self at all. Whoo! This is a tough one. It's a battle over self, guys. This is the work of the Holy Spirit, not of a human will. We cannot overcome self on our own. We cannot. It is only by morning by morning by the abiding, by spending that time, by not by staying with Christ, that we are able to stand. Thank you, Lord, that we have your word, that we have your Holy Spirit, and that it is a promised gift to us, as long as we accept it. The most precious fruit, uh, this is from um, Reflecting Christ, uh, my daily devotional. This is a devotional that came to me this week. I mean, in perfect timing. The most precious fruit of sanctification is the grace of meekness. And we know that grace is God's power. So put it that The most precious fruit of sanctification is the power of meekness. When this power presides in the soul, the disposition is molded by its influence, there is a continual waiting upon God and a submission of the will to His. The understanding grasps every divine truth. Look at that. The understanding, the grasp of every divine truth, and the will bows to every divine precept. Without doubting or murmuring, true meekness softens and subdues the heart and gives the mind fitness for the engrafted word. It brings the thoughts into obedience to Jesus Christ. It opens the heart to the word of God and Lindia's was open, as Lindia's was opened. It places us with Mary as learned of the feet of Jesus, as learned at the feet of Jesus. The meek he will, gu will he guide in judgment and the meek will he teach his ways. The language of the meek is never that of boasting. Like the child Samuel, they pray, Speak, Lord, for thy servant heareth thee. Meekness, is in, meekness in the school of Christ is one of the marked fruits of the Spirit. It is a grace wrought by the Holy Spirit as a sanctifier and enables its possessors at all times to control a rash and an impetuous temper. It's self-control. When the grace of meekness is cherished by those who are naturally sour or hasty in dis disposition, they will put forth the most earnest effort to subdue their unhappy temper. Every day they will gain self-control until that which is unlovely, that is unlike Jesus, is conquered. They become assimilated to the divine pattern until they obey the spirit injunction. Be swift to hear, slow to speak, and slow to wrath. This has not been me. I am not there yet. Well, I am still in this elevator ride. And I know that many of us are. But we have victory through him. And we know that when he comes, that we will have that victory. Meekness is an inward adorning which God estimates of great price. The apostle speaks of this as more excellent and valuable than gold or pearls or costly array. While the outward adorning beautifies only the moral, mortal body, the ornaments of meekness adorns the soul and connects finite man with the infinite God. This is the ornament of God's own choice. He who garnished the heavens with the orb of light has by the same Spirit promised that he will beautify the meek with salvation. God's given me this devotional after I had already written down every one of these verses. I've already looked into them and prayed over them. Angels of heaven will register 
as best adorned those who put on the Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord Jesus, and walk with him in meekness and lowly of heart. There are high, there are high attainments for, for the Christian. He may ever be rising to higher attainments, sanctified life. I know, I know many of you guys may know the book, uh, Thoughts from the Mount of Blessings. Well, Rachel had packed up all of our books because we we're getting ready to move soon. And she had packed up my other devotional book, and I reached in, and I reached in just to grab a book, and this is the book I pulled out. <laughs> Thought. Throughout the Beatitudes, there is an advancing line of Christian experience. Those who have felt their need of Christ, those who have mourned because of sin and have sat with Christ in the school of affliction, will learn meekness from the divine teacher. Through this affliction, we are going to learn. Patience and gentleness under wrong were not characteristics prized by the heathen or by the Jews. The statement made by Moses under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit that he was the meekest man upon the earth would not have been regarded by the people of his time a condemn or accommodation. It would rather have been excited pity or contempt. But Jesus places meekness among the first qualifications from his kingdom. In his own life and character, the divine beauty of this precious grace is revealed. Jesus, the brightness of the Father's glory, thought it not a thing to be get, grasped to be on equality with God, but emptied himself, taking the form of a servant. Revelate, or Philippians 2, 6 and 7. Through all the lowly experiences of life, he consented to pass, walking among the children of men, not as a king to demand homage, but as one whose mission it was to serve others. There was in, this, in his manner no taint of bigotry, no cold austerity. The world's redeemer had a, great, a greater than angelic nature yet united with his divine majesty were meekness and humility that attracted all to himself. So if we have this characteristic, people are going to be drawn to you. Linda, what you are doing in the community, people are drawn to that. Jesus emptied himself and in all that he did, self did not appear. He subordinated—sorry, <clears throat> subordinated all things to the will of his Father. When his when, <clears throat> when his mission on earth was about to close, he could say, "I have glorified thee on earth. I have finished the work which thou have given me to do." And he bids us learn of me. For I am meek and lonely in heart. If any man will come after me, let him deny himself. Let self be dethroned and no longer hold the supremacy of the soul. He who beholds Christ is his self, or <laughs> he who beholds Christ in, him, in his self denial, his loneliness of heart will be constrained to say, as did Daniel, when he beheld one like the Son of Men, my comeliness was turned in to me into corruption. The more that we look at Christ, the more we will see the flaws in ourselves. But as we keep beholding, he keeps transforming. The independence of self-supremacy in which we glory are seen in the true vileness as tokens of servitude to Satan. Human nature is ever struggling for expression, ready to contest, but he who learns of Christ is emptied of self, of pride, of love of supremacy, and there is a silence in the soul. Self is yielded to the disposal of the Holy Spirit. 
then we are not anxious to have the highest place. We have no ambition to crowd and elbow ourselves into notice, but we feel that our highest place is at the feet of the Savior. That's where I want to lay. We look to Jesus, waiting for his hand to lead, listen for his voice to guide. The Apostle Paul had this experience, and he said, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless, yet I live. But not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God. We just talked about in the Sabbath school, his faith. We have the faith of Christ, who loved me, and gave himself for me. When we receive Christ as an abiding guest in our soul, the peace, God, uh, the peace of God, which patheth all understanding, will keep our hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. The Savior's life on earth, though lived in the midst of conflict, was a life of peace. While angry, enemies were constantly pursuing him. He said, he that sent me is with me. The Father hath not left me alone, for I do always the things that please him. You know how he was able to get through that? By morning, by morning, spending that alone time with, Christ, with God in the wilderness. He would go to the cities. He would go to the places of where bad things were happening. But he would not go there until he was filled. I don't go to work in the morning until I am filled. It's a must. We don't want to just go out there without God's presence with us. But when we're filled with God, when he's for us, who can be against us? No storm of human or satanic wrath could disturb the calm that perfect that perfect communion with God. And he, says, <clears throat> and he says to us, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lonely in heart, and ye shall find rest. When this world, which we see, is falling apart rapidly, and we have a peace that he has given us, when we take his yoke upon us, and we show that meekness through craziness that we have, a, that we stand on those promises and on His word, and that we're not worried. I mean, I might even say, yet say that some of us should be excited because our, our, our God is coming. But to be able to share that through just how we, our character. Bear with me the yoke of service for the glory of God and uplifting of humanity, and you will find the yoke easy and the burden light. It is the love of self that destroys our peace. While self is alive, we stand ready to continually guard it from the, from the mortifications and insult. But when we are dead and our life is hid with Christ in God, we shall not take neglects or slights to heart. It won't bother us when somebody, because you know, when somebody's angry, I, I know people that are just angry all day, all night, every day, miserable. And I, it breaks my heart to watch that because their life must be terrible. They have no hope. They don't have a hope in Christ. And we have the opportunity to show them that and to show a joy uh, that a lot of people don't have. We shall be deaf to reproach and blind and scorn and insult. Love suffereth long and is kind. Love envieth not, love vaunteth not, glorifies not itself. Is not puffed up, doth not behave itself seem unseemly. Seeketh not its own, is not provoked, taketh not account of evil, rejoice not in unrighteousness, but rejoice with the truth. Beareth all things, that believeth all things, hope all things, endureth all things. Remember, 
Adoring is part of abiding. Love never faileth. Happiness drawn from the from earthly sources is a changeable as varying circ- is as changeable as varying circumstances it can make it. But the peace of Christ is a constant and abiding peace. Saying it doesn't matter what you're going through. When you have that abiding peace in Christ, when your tire's flat, your engine blows up, your house burns down, you're still going to have that same abiding peace because you're going to know that this world is not your home. And that you're, when fiery darts are being shot at us, we should be praising God because we're doing something right. Because the enemy's scared. It does not depend on any circumstance in life on the amount of worldly goods or the number of earthly friends, Christ is the foundation of living water, and happiness drawn from him can never fail. The meekness of Christ manifested in the home will make the inmates happy. It provokes no quarrel, gives back no angry answer, but soothes the irritated temper and diffuses a gentleness that is felt by all within this home. The charmed circle. Wherever cherished, it makes the family of of earth a part of the one great family above. Far better would it be for us to suffer under the false accusations than to inflict upon ourselves the torture of retaliation upon our enemies. The spirit of hatred and revenge originated with Satan and can, can bring only evil to him who cherishes it. Lowliness of heart, that meekness which is the fruit of abiding in Christ, is the true secret blessing. He will beautify the meek with salvation. The meek shall inherit the earth. It was through the desire for self-exaltation that sin entered into the world. And our first parents lost the dominion over this fair earth. Their kingdom, it, <clears throat> sorry, it is through self-abnegation that Christ redeemed what was lost. And he says, we are to overcome as he did. Through humiliation and self-surrender, we may become heirs with him. The meek shall inherit the earth. The earth promised to the meek will not be like this darkened with the shadow of death and and the curse. We, according to his promise, look for a new heaven and a new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. There shall be no more curse but the throne of God and the Lamb shall be in it and his servants shall serve him. There is no disappointment, no sorrow, no sin. No one shall say, I am sick. There are no burial trains, no mourning, no death, no parting, no broken hearts. But Jesus is there. Peace is there. They shall not hunger nor thirst. Neither shall the, the heat nor sun smite them. For he that hath mercy on them shall lead them. Even by the springs of water shall he guide them. Beautiful. Now I just want to share just a few things of examples in the Bible of people with meekness. And, and I want to ask the question, did they bear fruit? Just a small one. We've just witnessed so much from Jesus and we continue every day. But here in Romans 5, 6, for when we were yet without strength, we had nothing yet. We were without strength. In due time, Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man would one die. Yet uncertainly for a good man, some would even dare to die. We're not even certain if we would die for a good person, let alone an unrighteous person. But God commendeth his love towards us, and that while we were sinners, while we were his enemies, Christ died for us. While the people were reviling him on the cross and spitting at him, 
He died for them. Did, did his meekness bear fruit? We're standing here today because his meekness is bearing fruit now. Because that no better love has no man that he lay down his life but he, for his friends, but let alone his enemies. It's hard. It's hard to lay down your life for people that you may not agree with in so many levels. To love those who hate you and spitefully use you. It happens on a daily basis. But what are we called to do? We're called to be meek and lonely, to be different, to be set apart, to not be somebody that comes back with what that you are given, but you instead you give light for darkness. This one's a little bit lengthy, but it's, it kind of it serves the purpose you got to hear with the whole story, the meekness of Moses. In Numbers 12, 1, And Miriam and Aram spoke, spake against Moses because of the Ethiopian woman who he had married. For he had married an Ethiopian woman. Some, a, lot of, a lot of times, that's the unpardonable sin for a man. Don't speak against my wife. Uh, you know, it's true. But they're speaking bad words because of who he married. Oh, you see that wife he came in with? She was wearing a skirt that was... <sighs> Numbers 12, 2. And they said, Hath the Lord indeed spoken only to Moses? Hath he spoken also by us? And the, the Lord heard it. Now the man Moses was very meek above all the men which were upon the face of the earth. And the Lord spake suddenly unto Moses and unto Aaron and unto Miriam, Come out ye thee unto the tabernacle of the congregation. And they three came out. And the Lord came down in the pillar of the cloud and stood in the door of the tabernacle and called Aaron and Miriam. And they both came forth and he said, Hear now my words. If there be a prophet among you, I, the Lord, will make myself known unto him in vision and will speak unto him in dreams. But my, service, my servant Moses is not so, who is faithful in all mine house. With him I will speak mouth to mouth, even apparently, and not in dark speeches and in simil similitudes of the Lord, shall he behold. Wherefore then, were ye not afraid to speak against my service, servant Moses? Look at Moses' is meek, and look at God has, has his back. Because he stood, he, 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 he was set apart from the group. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against them, and he departed. And the clouds departed from off the tabernacle, and behold, Miriam became leprous, white as snow. And Aaron looked upon Miriam, and behold, she was leprous. And Aaron said unto Moses, Alas, my Lord, I beseech thee, lay not this sin upon us, wherein we have done foolishly, and wherein we have sinned. Let her not be as one dead, of whom the flesh is half consumed when he cometh out from his mother's womb. And Moses cried unto the Lord, saying, Hear her, Heal her now, Lord, O God, I beseech thee. Mercy. Did God hear Moses? Aaron still became... The, the head priest, the high priest of Le Levites, he forgave. The meekness of Stephen. When they heard these things, this is talking about he, uh, Stephen, for some of you that may, may not know, Stephen just, he, he just gave the gospel. To, uh, and it cut to their heart. 
uh, he told them the truth. And this is before his uh, stoning. Or during his stoning, sorry. This is after they had heard everything that he had said. He went through their whole history with them. And then shared how they had, had killed the Messiah. When they heard these things, they were cut to the heart. And they gnashed on him with their teeth. Cut to the heart usually means to me that they were convicted. I know when sometimes when I've read some things as I've been going through my Christian walk, I've had things cut me to the heart. But I got to choose. I made a decision whether to follow that conviction or to walk away from it. But when he, being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly into heaven, he saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God. And he said, Behold, I see the heavens have opened and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. Then they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and, run, and ran upon him in one accord. That's not the one accord I want to be in. And cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the, wit and the witnesses laid their, clo their clothes at a young man's feet whose name was Saul. And they stoned Stephen, calling upon God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And he kneeled down and cried with a loud voice, Lord, lay not this sin upon their charge. And he said this and fell asleep. Did Stephen stoning bear fruit? Who did Saul become? Paul. His meekness, what Saul saw, cut him to the heart and it first made him angry because basically it, well, everything he knew in life has totally just changed. And a lot of people don't accept change that well. But the meekness of this man, what he saw, how his face shined with the glory of God, transformed Paul to be one of the greatest disciples and to be the one to go out and give the message to the heathens. Wow. There's another one that I, I, I forgot to add in here, but as I was praying this morning, Daniel. Daniel was taken from his people. He was made a eunuch, and I know that most of you guys know what that means. And he was brought into one of the greatest heathen nations you could ever be put in. Was he separating him? Was he separated from the evils of the world? No. God made him a light to go into the darkness. Did Daniel bear fruit? Did Nebuchadnezzar eventually become a follower of Christ? Is his stories written still for our ammunition to see and to read to see? Did people witness them in the lion's den and in the fiery furnace being saved? If we're out there in our own little bubble, what's there to be saved from? Where's the witnessing going to happen? If we're we're going to be put in places... But God is going to be glorified there. We can't be scared of it. Because God does not, he's not, he does not give a spirit of fear. But man, I praise the Lord. I praise the Lord for these promises that, uh, that we too will gain this meekness. And that we will be able to use it to glorify God. That he will use us to glorify him. I believe that our last hymn is, I forgot what number it is.
Father, we thank you for your character. We thank you that you offer these gifts of this grace to us. And Lord, we're here today because we want to surrender it all to you, everything. And we want to bear your fruits. And we know that a major fruit is this meekness and that we gain this meekness through abiding in you. So, Father, we just ask, remove anything that is in our way that separates us from you, Lord. Help us to continually look into your, fold into your face and to become, so that we may become more like you. And we thank you that your word promises that this will happen to those who make that decision, Lord. We are here today making the decision because we love you, because you first loved us, Lord. And we know that what you did on that cross, while we were yet your enemies, give us the ability, Lord, to do that for ours. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.